So in the last episode, we looked at how we could log the user in and store the tokens so they stay logged in. So here you can see I'm on the app, I'm logged in, and my model has the token in it here. Now what I want to do is take that token and use it to make a request to the server endpoint. The server has an API endpoint called slash API slash me. You pass in the token as a header and it tells you data about your user. This is how we get the profile for the logged in user. This is what we're going to work on today. We're not going to display it in the UI, that'll be in the next video. But in this video, we're going to do the HTTP calls to get that data. Elm comes with an HTTP library that we can install. It's Elm slash HTTP. However, I'm a big fan of this one, Elm HTTP Builder by Luke Westby. It's just a nicer API over the underlying Elm HTTP module, and it's what we're going to use today. So what I'm actually going to do is just copy this whole uh, example. In fact, we don't need all of it. Let's just take these bits to get us started. So I'll copy those. So I'm going to create a new file in this Elm directory, and I'm just going to call it api.elm. You might be thinking here that I should go more specific and create a user API file. One of the beauties about Elm as your app grows is because the compiler is there, it makes it really easy to refactor things around. So I found when building Elm apps, you don't really need to worry about file structure up front as you do a JavaScript. You can just kind of write some Elm code, and if you need to move it around later, the compiler will help you. I'll just paste in that code we had, uh, and I'm actually just going to comment that out for a second whilst we create our module. So we'll say module API exposing. Uh, we'll leave it as dot dot for now. The latest version of Elm format actually replaces dot dot for you with all the things you've defined. So you'll see that happen in a minute. And we're going to create a function called fetch user information. And it's going to create a token. We, now we need to import that type. We'll come on to that in a minute. And then it's going to return a command of type message. The reason it takes a token is that's how we're going to identify and authenticate our user with our API. So we'll say fetch user information token equals. And I like to just leave my functions with a definition that makes them pass the compiler. So we'll just say command.none for now and hit save. And you can see we're immediately getting errors that we don't have a token type and we don't have a message type. The problem is what we could do is import main like this, but in a minute in the main file, we're going to import API. So we'll end up with a circular dependency that Elm will let us have. So what we're actually going to do at this point is create a new file called types.elm. And this is where we're going to house the types that are common throughout our entire application. Now this won't become a dumping ground for all types, but ones that are very common, like the message type, the model type, and the token, we'll put in this file and we can import them. So I'm going to create a new file again, and we'll call it types.elm. And again, I can say module types exposing dot dot. And let's go back into main.elm and just find the types that we want. So flags can stay in main.elm. It's actually these that we need right now, token, model, and message. And root, uh, we could do that now, but we'll leave that. We'll leave routing to another video. So for now, we're just going to pull these bits uh, in and put them into here. Notice when I save the file now, Elm format actually puts the exposing types in there for me, which is really nice. Uh, you can see I've missed key here, which we need. That comes from Elm navigation. So we'll just go and copy uh, this import over here. Browse, sorry, browser navigation, put that in. Great, so this file is happy. So an API, we can import types exposing dot dot. Normally I wouldn't recommend using dot dot. That just pulls everything in. It means your namespace can get very cluttered. When it's very, very common stuff like types, it's going to get boring if we had to refer to it as types.token every time. So I like to just expose all my types. I can copy this line because we're going to need it in main.elm as well. Great. So we're back green. The compiler's happy. And now we can import our types. So let's take a look at actually creating this fetch user information token. And we can use the example of HTTP Builder down here in order to do it. So I'm going to copy this stuff up. We're not going to need a command quite as complicated as this, but it will kind of get us in the right place. Uh, our request isn't a post, it's a get. And we will change this so it's not hard coded, but I know for now our server is on localhost 3000 and the endpoint is slash, uh, slash API slash me. We have no query params, but we do have a header. It's called X token. And the value here is going to be the token as a string. If you recall though, our token type is a token with a string associated with it. So we need to pull that out of the actual token. I can't just pass in token here because it's not a string, it's a token type. I need the string that we've wrapped in the token type. And you can destructure this in the function definition. So if I replace token here with token token, that's going to let me access the actual string that's wrapped up in that type. Uh, with JSON body, we're not going to post anything, so we don't need that one. Uh, we don't need timeout, the default timeout's fine. And then we have with expect JSON, items decoder will become, let's do me decoder for now. We can change name later. And then we're going to send the request and have to handle the response. This could be an HTTP error or the actual data if we've uh, encoded it. Or sorry, decoded it correctly. So we'll say handle uh, fetched 
fetch user request. Again, we can change these names later, so you don't need to worry about them too much for now. So let's first define the MIDI coder. The uh, MIDI coder, if I could type. So it's going to be a JSON decoder. We're going to need to install the JSON decoding uh, library, but we'll do that in a minute. So we'll say uh, decoder. Uh, that's going to decode into a type that again we don't yet have. For now I'm just going to say it will decode into a string. It's not actually going to do that, I just want to get the request going and look at it in the browser and then we can see what we actually need to decode into. So I'll say me dot, uh, sorry me decoder and we're just going to do uh, d for json decode which will import in a minute dot succeed which just means it ignores the json response and always succeeds and we'll just succeed with hello world. I'm doing this just because I want to get this running so we can see the request being made in the browser before we then worry about decoding the specifics. So that's the decoder. We're going to have to say the handle fetch user request and it needs to return a message so it's going to take a result which could be an HTTP error or it could be a string because it will have decoded successfully and return a message. And we're actually just going to make this, uh, if we say result, we're going to make it return no op, the no op message. So we're just going to keep it really straightforward for now. So let's save that. We're going to need to do some installing. So I'll pop open the terminal and we're going to install uh, elm slash json, which is the first one we need. In this case, actually, I've got it in my uh, elm json file, but it's in the indirect dependencies, meaning it's a dependency of a dependency. So elm has now told me that it's moved it into the direct dependencies so I can import it. And we're also going to need the uh, elm HTTP builder, which is luke westby slash elm dash hp builder. And it's going to tell me that we need Elm's HTTP library as well as HP Builder, which we do. And now we should have what we need. So we need to do some importing here. So I need to import the HTTP package because we're referring to this error. I need to import json.decoding. And I'm going to say import json.decode. I like to refer to it as D, but I'll also always expose the type decoder. And then we need to import HTTP Builder. And if we look down here, there's some bits we've used that we need to import with header, with expect JSON, and send. Send to me is quite a generic name, so I usually do prefix that with HTTP Builder, but I will import with header and with expect JSON. So I'll say exposing with header, with header, and with expect, uh, if I could type, with expect JSON. Great, and we don't have any failures here. I'll delete this big comment that we took from the example to get us started. So this is all looking good. So now what we need to do in main.elm is actually trigger one of these HTTP requests. We can do this when we've grabbed a token for the user and logged them in. So let's go back into our main.elm. I'm going to import API, and I'm not going to expose anything. Down here in the init, we grab this token here. And our command says, if we have a token, then send it to storage, else do nothing. What I'm going to do here is we can actually replace it with command.batch, which takes a list of commands, and we'll fire them all. So we'll send the token to storage, and we're going to call api.fetch user information, and that's going to take the full token. You've got to be careful here, toc isn't the full token, it's the string that we've destructured. In this case, we want the full token. So this is a bit fiddly, but I think what we can do is say toc, token toc as, let's say, full token. Maybe, let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. So what we can do is we can destructure the token here, but we can still get a reference to it as the full token that's not been destructured, and we can pass that into our API. Let's go and see what's happening and if that's all compiling happily. So I switch back to the browser and refresh, and you see that the API module has a bad import, import HTTP. Let's go and figure out what's going on here, because you saw when we installed uh, the Luke Westby HTTP Builder module, we did install Elm HTTP as well. If you look in our elm.json, you'll see that HTTP Builder is there, and Elm HTTP has been moved into an indirect dependency. An indirect dependency means that anything in here that depends on it can use it, but we can't directly import it. So to allow us to directly import it, we just need to move it up into being a direct dependency and fix our uh, training commas there. It's still not working, so what I'm going to try now is just uh, turning Webpack off and rerunning it from scratch again. I think because we're running in watch mode, it might have got a bit confused. So I stopped Webpack, ran it again, and you can see the request now to the me endpoint is now running. This first request is our options request because we're running uh, on a different domain, so we're using a cross-origin response, which is configured. And then our second is the actual response from the GET request. So you can see our token down the bottom here. And if I go into preview, you can see all the data the API has given us back. So it's given us back our post, which is empty. This is going to be how we're going to start building up our blogging platform. And then give me when I was created, my email, my ID, my name, the thing that I've OAuthed with, so this is GitHub, 
we're only going to use GitHub OAuth through this course, but this server is built to potentially allow users to use Twitter or Facebook or Google or something else. And we can see our token there as well, which matches. So now what we need to do is actually start trying to decode this using our decoder. And what I'm going to do is actually copy this into our Elm so we can build a decoder for it. So let's paste this in here, and I'm just going to comment that out. Now we're not going to worry about decoding it all right now. For example, posts we're not going to concern ourselves about. Let's just pull out the name for now. Let's say name, uh, and in fact, just the name. That's all we need for now. However, we are going to want to add more stuff to this user. So I'm going to create a user type. So we'll go into our types, and we'll create a type, type alias user. Again, a user is such a global concept throughout our app that I'm willing to put it in this types file. Elm's compiler makes refactoring so easy that if I decide this is the wrong place later, it's going to be very easy for me to move it out. So things like where should I put this particular bit of code, don't worry about them as much in the early stages of your application. And we can say for now that the user has a name that is a string. And right now that's really all we need. We'll expand this as we build out functionality. So we're going to go now to our decoder, and we're going to say now we decode a user. And so let's actually uh, decode this. So we're going to say d.map, which is one of the JSON decode functions. You might be familiar with the no red ink Elm JSON pipeline decoding plugin. We'll look at using that package later as I do think it makes decoding much easier. But for now, we're just going to use the built in map functions. In this video, I'll also share a link to a blog post I wrote on Elm decoders, which tries to demystify how they work exactly, which I think you'll find useful. We won't dive into it in super detail now. But we're saying map here because I've only got one part of the user record that I care about. It's only got one field called name. If we had two, we'd say map two, map three, map four, and so on. And so we're going to map into a user and we need to decode the one field. So I'm going to say decode the field, uh, what's it called, name, and it will be a string. And you see I'm getting an error now. Let's hover over that. It's saying it cannot find a user type. I actually think this is just the VS Code plugin being a bit out of sync because we have definitely defined it here. In fact, no, it's not. It's because we're not exposing up here. So we need to add the user type here. Top tip, if you have forgotten which types you do and don't need to add to this exposing, if you're in a module where you just want to expose everything, just swap them out for dot dot, hit save, and Elm format will cover you and expose them all. And now you can see that warning has go away. So I was rather eager there to blame the plugin, when in fact it was me uh, making a mistake. So let's get rid of this big comment for now. As I said, we'll decode more of the user's data later on in this series. Let's just time that up a bit. And now we need to actually handle fetching a user request. So the result is going to be one of two things. It's going to be an error or it's going to succeed with a user. So we're going to update this type here from string to user. And that's what this error down here, this red, is dealing with. And for now, I'm going to be bad and not deal with the error case. What we'll do in a future video is we'll say if the user, if we didn't get this response, we failed to log in, we'll check why and we might log the user out or we might show them a nice error message. We'll deal with this later on in a, in a future video. Uh, I'm not going to try and stick to shorter videos, so I don't want to do too much in just one here. So okay, case result of, if it's an error with some error, we're just going to return no op. I'm going to leave ourselves a to-do deal with the error. But if it's okay and we got a user, we'll say fetched user user. And this is a new message type that we haven't created yet. So let's go into our types. So message is currently no up. We're going to say, or it will be fetched user uh, with a user attached to it. Now let's go and make sure we deal with this message type in our update. So if we scroll down to our update here, you can see we're only dealing with the no op case. Let's go into here and we'll say fetched user u. And all I'm going to do for now is just log this out and we'll deal with actually using this data and rendering it to the UI in a future video. So I'll say underscore equals debug.log user u. Uh, and we'll just still return model command dot none. So you can see we now do get user name equals Jack Franklin, and that's decoding correctly. So we did loads in this video. We made our first API request. We looked at how the Elm HCP builder can help us build out requests much more easily using its pipeline syntax. This is actually one of the main reasons I like this package. I think this syntax is really, really clean. And as a, so a new developer joining a team, say, you can easily read this and see exactly what's going on. And then we've also now made the request, we've decoded the user, and we're ready now to put that user into our model. We're not actually putting it anywhere at the moment, we're just logging it. And then we can finally get on to start rendering some UI onto the screen.